Hello, everyone, and thank you for viewing this recording of the Analyzing Digital Multimedia Evidence with Input Ace webinar. This webinar was originally delivered on June 22, 2017, and has been edited for time. The Input Ace software is designed primarily for two types of users investigators who need a simple drag and drop interface for viewing, converting, and analyzing video evidence, and forensic video analysts who also require powerful analytical tools to conduct their analysis. Input Ace combines all of those needs and more into a very simple interface with drag and drop functions. For those of you who have not had a chance to uh, experience Input Ace or to view past webinars, um, what I'm going to be doing here today is jumping into a very fast uh, overview to start the webinar off of the ins and outs of the Input Ace application. Um, I'm going to do that very quickly so that we can get to um, some more interesting things uh, and spend most of the time going through practical case examples about how uh, we use this within our office and how agencies across North America um, and in Europe are, are using it as well. So uh, again, my name is uh, Andrew Fredericks, and as Doug said, uh, I'm, a, I'm a certified uh, forensic video analyst through LIVA. And the Input Ace project really began uh, after the Vancouver riots in 2011. Um, they had received about 5,000 or over 5,000 hours of video of individuals who were um, involved in the riot from countless different sources, from cell phones, from CCTV systems. Um, and that's an incredibly serious challenge to comb through all that evidence and to properly lay charges. Uh, so what ended up happening was um, Vancouver um, got involved with uh, Leva, um, and the principal of Input Ace uh, managed a project that called 50 forensic video analysts from across the country into uh, Indianapolis to process the 5,000 hours of video uh, and to begin a project to track all the individuals who were involved uh, in, in riot activity. Um, that project required 50 analysts working around the clock in eight-hour shifts to get all of the evidence in aligned and ready to move on to the next step, which is an incredibly, incredibly difficult task. And because of that project, Input Ace began its research into how to simplify and how to do that process better. Um, that project ended up winning the uh, ISCP August Vollmer Award for Advances in Forensic Science. And again, the results of all of that have culminated in today what has become Input Ace. So let's take a quick look at what kinds of problems the individuals encountered when dealing with the Vancouver riot case or with any case that involves video evidence, um, especially that coming from CCTV systems. We don't get video in the .mp4 format or a .avi format very frequently. In fact, that's uh, very uncommon to get anything that is a normal file in our world, in the, in the video world, what we typically receive are files that look like this, a .irf file. And there's no way to simply double click and play this file with common Windows programs like VLC, for example. I can't just double click this uh, and have this open up with VLC and play. Um, and I do have two monitors here, by the way. So if something opens up on my other monitor, I will just drag that over for you so that you can see this. Um, and you'll notice that we can't play this. So what can we do? Well, frequently what happens is a manufacturer of the DVR will create a player and provide that with the files so that an individual can double click on the player and have this open up the file. So let's take a look at what that might look like. I'm going to open our .irf file within the manufacturer's proprietary player and lo and behold, I can see all 16 cameras. So we're, now we're one step ahead of where we were before but is this playing things back correctly? Am I getting the most accurate evidence? And am I viewing things in a way that are not going to run into troubles when trying to testify or trying to use this in court? Uh, again, when you come across an expert on the opposing side who is going to poke holes in the way that the analysis was done, we need to ensure that we're dealing with the best evidence right from the start. Um, if we're not dealing with the best evidence, number one, we can miss, uh, miss evidence. Um, we can misinterpret the evidence because of the way that compression works. We might be missing frames, and all of that culminates into a, a big issue unless we start from the right evidence right from the very beginning. So what is this right now? Well, this is a player that has a window that I cannot change the size of. Oh, excuse me. I can't change the size of, and I can simply play, I can pause, I can stop, and I can use these two keys here 
um, to snap forward by a bunch of frames. Um, this isn't even going frame by frame. This is just jumping forward by uh, many frames. So I don't have a whole lot of control over what I'm going to do with this particular file. Um, in fact, I don't even have any export processes. Um, I have a couple buttons here, um, like this one, which when I click, appears to do absolutely nothing. Um, and I have a button here that when I click, will create a new snapshot folder with a bunch of uh, images, or rather a single image from this camera, um, that is coming out at a dimension of 704 by 480. So for those of you who have been doing this for a while, um, that frame dimensions is something that's quite common. Uh, it's something we'll see very frequently. And it's a pretty decent sign that this bitmap export might actually be the correct evidence at the correct size. Um, now, that, again, that's not to say that it's the correct display size, but we're talking about just the pixel dimensions at this point. So is this image here that we got out the same as what's being displayed on screen within the player? Well, to do that, I'm going to use a little tool here to measure the screen size. And I can already see that even with that blue border, I'm looking at a dimensions of 648 by 526, which is different than the dimensions that I extracted with a bitmap. So I can't change the size of this window, and I can only get bitmaps to be exported. So what I would suggest is if the only option we had was this proprietary player, the best evidence that we're going to get is by going frame by frame forward and exporting out bitmaps for every sing single frame of video which would take hours and hours and hours. Uh, if we were to simply screen capture and play through all this video, we're capturing it at the wrong dimensions and getting the wrong evidence right from the start. So again, very, very cumbersome, um, some serious issues with this. And if we're going to get the right evidence, we're going to have to go through a process that is uh, not going to be a, a achievable when we're talking about 16 cameras and trying to get every single frame. So is there a better way? Well. Uh, for those of you who, are, again, have been in this for quite a while, uh, one potential better way is to use a tool like FFmpeg to take a look at the raw frames. But in this particular case, let's take a look at how FFmpeg might see this file. So I'm going to use a quick little command here. Again, this is a slightly more advanced process. But I'm going to take um, the program FFplay, which is part of the uh, FFmpeg package here, and I'm going to force the file to be read as if it's an H.264 file. And I get this. Again, another very common thing that we see. And the reason that we see this is because the way that the video files uh, are commonly compressed involve a process of taking an image from a camera that incorporates essentially every single pixel of this image. So this is a full unique image. We have everything that I need from this image. The problem is subsequent images are going to reuse bits of data from this frame in order to save space. So if I had one camera, I might have a frame that looks like this, also referred to as an iframe. And subsequent frames, also referred to as p-frames, will be copying data from this frame, which will work great if I have one camera. But the problem is when I have two cameras, my next frame might be a frame from a different camera. And it's copying the data from the wrong image. And that's why when I go through this frame by frame, we see all these errors popping in. And we're looking at data from multiple different cameras combined together to create this view that looks like a corrupted video. Now, it's not exactly corrupted. It's just not being read correctly. So FFmpeg doesn't read this file correctly. The player is reading the file incorrectly. It's extracting images correctly, but it will be a very, very time-consuming process to get this out. So instead, we now have input ace. What input ace allows me to do is take the raw original videos, like this .irf file, drag it into the file list, and input ace is now going to allow me to play the file when I click this interrogate button. It's going to load the file into my interrogate window, and I'm going to be able to see every single stream of video within the file. So instead of viewing this like FFmpeg views this with all of the streams slammed together into one uh, video, when I press play, I'm viewing one camera from one angle with all the frames being displayed accurately at the dimensions of 704 by 480. And I can even toggle over to my other camera views, and I can begin to view all the data and start to do some very cool things with the file. Uh, in fact, an additional thing that I'm doing is extracting out the timestamp directly from the raw data. Now, you might notice that the time is going to be a difference here by about three hours. Uh, that's because I'm currently in the Pacific uh, Coast. Um, and you can see that here with the little display. Uh, and the video here is recorded on the East Coast. So it's a three-hour time difference. Um, this is how this timestamp is actually stored in the file. So now we can do a lot of different things. I can begin to export images. I can begin to make clips. I'll be showing you a lot of that throughout the webinar. Um, but one of the most common requests that we have is, 
um, somebody wanting to take all of these different streams, turn them into something that we can play back in court, and maintain all of the raw pixel values. So again, I want to play this in court, but I don't want to change any of my evidence. So how can I do that? Well, that's a very simple process where we go away from our interrogate tab, where again, the interrogate tab is the location that we can play the data, we can scrub back and forth, we can mark images, we can make clips, which I'll get to later. The workflow tab is where we can begin to build and design various workflows to process the media in a whole bunch of very cool ways. The most simple kind of way to process the media is to say, I want to take these different files, uh, these different streams rather, and I want to turn them into MP4 files. So on my right hand side here, I'm going to click on MP4. It pops open some settings for how I'd like to change the files. I then want to open up an output folder, which is currently set to my outputs directory here on my desktop. I'm just going to call this stream. And then what I'm going to do here is change my transcode video setting away from the default H.264, which we'll use later in the webinar, and I'm going to set this to same as input. So these settings are saying, take anything that's connected to my output node and process them same as input. Don't change any of the evidence, just put it into an MP4 container. And now I can send my single stream or all of my streams at once. I can connect them to that output to MP4. I've now built my first workflow processing all the data to MP4. I click execute and now very quickly here in my output directory, we're going to begin seeing all 16 different streams popping in here, now playable as MP4s. And I can simply double click this and it's playing through. Now you might notice it's playing through a bit quickly. Uh, well, the problem is the frame rate of this file, if we go back to my interrogate tab, the frame rate of this file is currently highlighted saying that the 25 frame per second is just a default playback speed because the frame rate isn't reported within, within the file itself. So what I might want to do is change the frame rate manually. And I can identify the frame rate by using my arrow keys to frame step forward and backward. And I'm just simply going to count the number of frames per second literally. So this is the first frame at 144.25, and I'm going to count. Frame 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then it changes. So in this particular interval, that was 7 frames per second. I might recount this in a couple of other areas just to validate that it really is 7 frames per second, um, but I can, I've already done that in this case, and I can say that, that that is the case. So what I'm going to do now is toggle back to my workflow tab. I'm going to go into my output directory, and let me just delete all these files. So I've gotten rid of everything. I've cleaned out my output directory, and to change this workflow to make all of the outputs play back at seven frames per second, it's a very easy process. I click on my output settings to open this output node back up, and underneath frame rate, I'm going to simply type in seven. So I've changed my workflow. I'm going to rerun. It's going to be very quick again. Uh, it's going to pop uh, all of these 16 different streams um, into my output folder, and now I can double click on any one of these different streams and it's going to play back at the appropriate speed. And we can see that the time clock is changing appropriately. And now we can open up something with some motion to see that everyone's moving in an appropriate speed. So this is what we mean by a very basic input ACE workflow. Uh, we're taking a series of streams or files, connecting them through to an output node and processing them. Now you might notice that there's a couple of organizational things here in the file list that are worth noting. Um, for one, a single file might have multiple streams. And we also have, by default, a group where the file is inside of the group. And we can expand the file to reveal its streams, and we can expand the group to reveal its files. Um, I'll show you some more um, intricate file lists uh, later on where we have more files all at once. Um, but that group hierarchy um, it can be quite important to help us organize our data. Um, but again, I'll show you that here at a later point in the webinar. So that, again, is a very basic workflow. Well, let's take a look at another type of file uh, where a similar process might need to occur. Um, I have a .exe file here, uh, which is a very common file format that we see. And if I double click on this exe, it automatically opens up the file, and I can play it and reveal that it has two different camera angles. So just like before, let's take a quick look at all the various options we have. Well, I can't scale the window, and if I open up one of the camera angles, um, is this frame dimension displaying accurately? Well, again, I'm gonna use this little tool here um, to measure uh, roughly what the dimensions of the frame are. And I see that it's displaying at roughly, you know, 720 by 540 probably, um, which again is not a common size for the actual pixels that would be stored in the file. So what can I do here? Uh, if I were to simply screen capture this, I'm already capturing it at, at an incorrect size. So I might want to do another couple of little observations within this player. 
to see that I have a save option. Um, and if I press the save option, I can save images or I can save video. Well, great, let's take a look and see what the save video options are. Well, right away, um, I see that I have a codec option filled with a bunch of various codecs that are on this system. Um, in this case, all of which are very heavily compressed codecs, and I would not want to select any of these options. Um, I also have an option to change the frame size, and the frame sizes here are all nothing that I probably want, except for maybe the something down in here. Um, so how can I validate what I actually need, and how can I get the data out into a format that is going to be correct so I can start my case using the correct evidence? Well, let's take a look at another option here within the save. I have a save as image actual size. Well, that seems promising. Let's press that, and I'm going to save an image. It gives me two options underneath my save type. I have JPEG, which is a compressed file format that I would not want to use. And I have bitmap, which is an uncompressed format um, that I use quite regularly. So great, I've got bitmap here. I'll name this uh, player export. And I've created a bitmap image on my desktop that I can open up and I can see that it looks to be roughly accurate. Um, I can even go into the properties of this and I can see that the dimensions here are 352 by 240, which is a very standard size. And I'm feeling fairly confident that that image is going to be something that I might want to use. But before I go any further, um, I don't have very many options for validating that process using the player alone. But again, we now have a more accurate method and a much quicker method by taking that file, dragging it into InputAce directly, and InputAce is going to read this exe by opening it up into its various streams. And now I can see the independent stream here relative to the independent stream over here. And I can, again, now have the entire power of the input ace workflow and interrogate tab to scrub back and forth to mark images, et cetera. So what do I mean by marking an image? Well, marking an image is a process of keeping notes and tags of various events within a timeline. So if we're tracking a suspect uh, through a homicide scene or a robbery scene, uh, we can use our M key to mark an image. In this case, I'm just marking a null image to compare this to what we get from the player export. And I'm going to call this uh, input ace. And we'll see that when we mark an image, we have a little uh, red mark in the timeline. And I also have a marked image that appears here in the file list. I can export that marked image by pressing this button down here to export all of the marked frames as images. And I can browse to where to export this. In this case, I'm just going to choose my desktop. And I'm going to say OK. And what's happened now is I have my input ace exported bitmap and my player exported bitmap. And now I can compare these two to see if there are any differences within the image. And at first glance, I might not see anything that's obvious. Uh, they're both displaying at a property of 352 by 240, and they both appear to be relatively similar. But let's take a quick look at a comparison between these two images. I'm going to drag those both into Photoshop, and I now can see my input ace image and my player image. And what I'm going to do here is copy my input ace image. I've just highlighted the whole image and copied it and I'm going to paste that on top of my player export. Now what I'd like to do here is zoom in. I'm going to just zoom into the image here a little bit so we can take a look at this in a little more detail. And I'm going to toggle back and forth between my two layers. So again, my top layer is my input ace export. My bottom layer is the player export. And watch what happens when I toggle between these. Well, the image is starting to look a little different between the two options. And what's happened here is the player has not only given us a bit of a border around the image, which mean, means that we're missing uh, a couple of pixels around the outsides, but more importantly, it's interpolated and duplicated a line of data at two different spots. So I'm zooming into the image here to show you a good example of this. I'm going to turn off my little grid here. Take a look at this line of data right here. This is the player export, and I'm going to go back to my input AS export. Notice this area right here has a duplicated line in the player. That data did not exist in the original file, but when the player displays it or the player exports it, it throws an entire horizontal line of additional pixels across the whole image. And there's another location up in here where there's an another line um, that gets duplicated across the image. So there's the player again, and there's the input ace version. And you'll notice that this whole area gets stretched right across this horizontal line across the image within the player. So is that a big deal? 
Well, it certainly can be in many cases. I mean, for one, if you come across an opposing expert that sees this, it can make you look a little silly on the stand. Um, but for number two, if you were doing any measurements or you were calculating any speeds, we now have additional pixels that don't actually exist in the original image, and the analysis is going to begin incorrectly right from the start. And we might not notice it without seeing what the raw evidence is from input A's to realize that that data doesn't actually exist. That is a duplicated line of pixels across the whole image that stretches the image in two different places. So again, right here there's a line, and down here there's a line. And we can see that as I toggle back and forth. So not only is input A's a significantly faster workflow to take the data from a format like the .irf format or this .exe format, and to turn it into a format that we can handle more easily, like MP4. And I'll, I'll do this one more time here, where I take MP4, I'll type in stream or any output file name that I'd like. I'm going to use the video same as input. I can connect my different video streams directly to my output node and click execute, and it's already done. And in my output folder, I now have those two video streams as MP4s. I can double click and play. So not only is this a significantly faster workflow to get accurate evidence out, but the alternative is an inaccurate method to get the data in very uh, many cases. And I'll show some additional ones where the players make some, um, some excruciating errors in the evidence. It can add additional lines, as we've seen. It can display at the wrong size, as we've already seen. It can miss images, as I'll show you at a later point in the webinar. Um, and there are other countless issues that we encounter with players. So now that we can see how we can build and design these workflows uh, to easily um, uh, handle our data, I'm going to click these two different folders and hit the delete key to delete out the items that are in the file list and clean it out. And let's take a look at one last process here, um, still using a simple workflow of just converting the data, where I go into my um, batch folder here, and I've got an example of a bunch of different file formats. Um, a lot of these are common, some of them are less common. We've got .re4, .dav, .vam, um, just a batch of various file formats. And instead of bringing them in one at a time, let's take a look at how absolutely fast this can be to drag all of these in at the same moment in time, drag them into input ace. Input ace is now going through a process to identify um, all the video frames and audio uh, packets in the file. We can click on the interrogate button to play the evidence, to scrub through, and I can even go to my workflow tab and connect any one or all of the different video files at once to my output node. Um, and then in, within the settings, I can define name for the clips, some settings for them. I can press OK and press Execute. And this is now going through and batch processing all these different formats all at once. And it's going to produce results here in my output directory um, that I can now double click on and play within a standard player like VLC. And again, if we needed to change the frame rate, we would be able to do that as well as part of the workflow. So again, this is an example of how to use input A's in very simple ways. And what I'm going to do now is take it up a little notch here and go through some slightly more complicated um, and more interesting um, options that we have within the program. So let's take a quick look at um, a, another case here and a a series of steps that we can do within a workflow to produce a demonstrative result that can be very helpful um, for a trier of fact. So let me drag this .dat file into input ace. I'm going to interrogate it here, um, play through the data, and at roughly this point in time here, um, a fight breaks out between a group of individuals in this bottom corner of the video. Um, to see it a little more easily, I'm going to use my mouse wheel to kind of zoom into the video a little bit. And we'll see that there's a fight and then ultimately someone is stabbed here just barely off camera. Um, it can be a little hard to see, um, not only because the original frame size is so small, um, but also because the frames are playing back a little too quickly and it's rather dark. So I'm gonna go through a series of different steps now to uh, create a demonstrative clip from these observations that allows me to see the evidence in a much uh, easier way. So I'm gonna go to this frame here, right where the, um, the action starts. I'm going to make a clip, so instead of processing the entire timeline, I'm going to make a subclip to process a small section of the timeline. I do that by marking my in point where I want to start my clip with my I key. I then play through the data. It's playing back quickly again. Um, I'm gonna go until I'm ready to stop my clip. How about right there? I'm gonna use my O key to mark my out. And we can now see that we have an in and an out in my timeline. I can snap back and forth between them using my Q and my W hotkeys. 
Um, for those of you who are new to Input Ace, all of the hotkeys are present in our help menu under the user manual. Um, it's at the very bottom of the user manual, um, but you can also just do a quick search. Um, I'm going to use my control F to find here. I'll type in hotkey. Oh, let me get rid of that backslash. Hotkey. Um, and I can see that it's on page 52, which I can just simply click on here, and it takes me to a glossary of all hotkeys. So you can see that my in and my out mark an in and out on the timeline, and Q and W are going to snap between those marks. Uh, and there's several other hotkeys um, that I'll, I'll touch on here briefly within the next uh, half hour of this webinar. Now that I have my in and out set, I'm going to use my S key to make a subclip. I'm just going to call this uh, clip. And now let's go through a series of different ways to process this clip in order to produce out an output that can be helpful for court. So one thing is maybe I just simply want that clip. Well, let me create an MP4 output. Um, I'm going to send that to my output directory, and I'll call this uh, demonstrative. Um, and we might have noticed, uh, I'm just going to say OK here briefly. We might have noticed on our interrogate tab uh, that things are playing back a little quickly, but I don't have a timestamp now to uh, identify what the frame rate should actually be. So I'm just going to kind of take a guess that things look like they're playing about twice as fast. So if the file is reporting that it's 2996 frames per second and it looks roughly twice as fast, um, I'm going to change this to 15 frames per second. Um, and again, that's not a statement of the actual frame rate. It's just something to get me a little bit closer for a demonstrative so that it views uh, uh, more likely like what it was uh, in reality. So I'm going to type in 15, say OK, press execute. So I've, the workflow is now complete. I now have an MP4 file. I can double click on unplay. And things look like they're probably playing maybe a little slow. It's hard to tell. Um, but it's close to the right speed. So I'm probably going to leave it like that for now, but we could tweak that a little bit if, if we thought that was playing back um, not quite quickly enough. So that's a clip that I could now um, send off to a, uh, in a report or to a trier of fact. And you'll notice in the settings of this MP4 output that the default settings are to be completely lossless. So the raw pixel values are completely unchanged. Uh, we've just simply turned it into an H.264. All the pixels are identical. Uh, and we can now uh, view that MP4 file outside. Um, if you wanted to go through a validation process to validate that no pixels are changed, um, go take a look at the last webinar that we have up on uh, Vimeo from a couple months ago. Uh, we have an option here on our output uh, nodes called frame hash CSV uh, that allows us to compare two different files and uh, view their frames to identify if any pixel differences exist within the frames. So let's make this workflow a little more interesting now. Um, I'm going to delete this line by just simply highlighting over it and using my delete key. And I'm going to progressively add some more interesting options to this. So under filters, I have an option to crop. And it adds another node within my workflow that can be dragged around in this area. Um, what I'm going to do is take the area of interest, and I'm going to crop and resize that area by dragging the file now to my crop node, opening the settings of crop, and clicking and dragging roughly in the area where the action occurs, which is roughly about there. Now I'm going to resize that result by going back into filters and adding a resize node, connecting my crop node to my resize node, and we can visualize that the workflow is getting um, the subclip cropped, and then that cropped version into my resize node, and I can see a preview of that within the settings of resize. Let's say right now what I want to do is uh, double the size of this. Well, what is 219 times 2? I don't know. I can't do that in my head. So I'm going to use a shortcut with an input ace to simply just type in times 2, which I find a lot easier. Um, and then I can check this checkbox here to maintain the aspect ratio and scale relative to whatever 292, uh, excuse me, 219 times 2 is. So now I've got a doubled size. Now what I'd like to do is take these uh, t uh, the results of the resize node, and I'm going to connect that to a levels adjustment node. Um, the levels adjustment node allows me to uh, take the range of pixel values and clip them to bring out a little additional contrast in the image. Um, something roughly there. If I go too far, I'm going to blow it all out with white. If I go, and if I don't go far enough, we're not going to see as much contrast. So somewhere right in about here is a, a good result to see the contrast in this image. Um, and if you'd like a better explanation of uh, what this is doing, uh, the manual is a great resource. Uh, and the two-day class uh, that we offer goes into um, great detail about all these different items and what's happening under the hood for all of this. So now my workflow looks like a subclip being cropped, being resized, and then being level adjusted. And what I'm going to do is one final step is add them into a canvas editor. So what the canvas editor does is take any inputs that are connected to it, and it's going to tile them into a grid. 
So what I've done now is I've taken my clip and I've put it down basically two different paths. One path gets cropped and resized and levels adjusted and put into a canvas, and the other path goes directly into the canvas, which means that when I open the settings for the canvas editor, I'm going to see a side-by-side -side of my original evidence and my cropped and resized and level adjusted version of that evidence. The canvas editor, very briefly, um, is normally used to do something more like this. Uh, let me show you a quick example here. Uh, let's grab that IRF file that we were dealing with at the beginning of the webinar. Um, it has, if you recall, uh, 16 different video streams here within the clip. Um, and each of these different 16 streams, I might want to put into a canvas to have them play back side by side so that we can watch all the evidence all at once. Um, now, if you recall, the evidence uh, within those streams was rather large. Um, the dimensions of it was uh, 704 by 480. So I'm going to quickly um, put this in half. Again, I can type in what the value is of half, or I can just type in divided by 2, a little quick um, shortcut that I like to use. And what I'm going to do is connect a few different streams, just as an example here, to that resize node. We've got now got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 different clips. Let's just add a couple more um, just for fun here. Um, and I'm using my control key to connect um, multiple different streams all at once. And now that I've got these different streams connected to resize, I'm going to drag that into Canvas Editor, open the settings for Canvas Editor, and it's now auto-tiled those nine different cameras. So this is a much more common interaction that, that people use the Canvas Editor for. We can now drag the items around, move uh, each of the different clips where we want to put them. Um, and this is a very common way that the Canvas Editor is used to combine multiple camera angles and play them side by side. What I've done here, just taking a step back again, what I've done here is a slightly more interesting way to use the canvas editor. I've taken a clip and I'm putting it into a canvas side by side with the same clip after doing some steps to clarify the data. And again, if I open up my settings, it looks like this, which we can move around the image where we would like to put it. Now that I have this side by side, let's connect that to MP4, open up the settings for my MP4, and I'm going to leave this name as demonstrative. I'll leave all the settings the same, press OK, and press execute. So now in my output directory, my new demonstrative clip looks like this. We've now provided a trier fact with the original evidence that they can watch and a highlighted area that shows the area of importance in much better detail. Uh, and we can very clearly see now that this individual here uh, removes an object from his pocket. That object has a, a reflective glare to it that we can see. Uh, and then he ultimately comes back and uses that object to, to stab an individual directly off camera. Okay, so that's another example of a slightly more complicated workflow. Um, and I do see that uh, I'm a little behind uh, timing on here, so I'm going to start speeding things up a little bit because um, I've got a lot to cover, and I want to make sure that we don't uh, miss out on some, uh, some case examples towards the end here. So to clear this all out, I'm going to click and drag over my workflow area, use my delete key to delete out that data, and then I'm going to delete the two groups by control clicking on them and using my delete key to remove everything um, out of um, that uh, um, that file is. So uh, another example of a very quick workflow is a process to concatenate the data. Um, and what I'm going to start this off with here is showing you how a, uh, a another proprietary player handles the raw data. So if I go into this folder right here, uh, we'll see that we have a bunch of .m4v files and some CTF files. Um, the CTF files are, are, are going to be metadata related files. We can see that they're really small. Um, and these M4V files are the video files that I'm going to be interacting with. But if I go back one level again here, they provided us with a, a proprietary player that I can double click on. Um, and I can now go and say file open. Um, and I'm going to browse now into um, the concatenate folder here to open up uh, this file. So again, let's take a look, quick look at what we have. We have a player. Um, it opens up at a size of roughly 622 by 405. Again, a random size. That doesn't really mean much to me. Um, and I do, in this case, however, have a method to scale the window. However, that is not a good thing. Um, I think this is often a misnomer that this is a good thing because we can now scale down to the size that we should be in order to do uh, some screen capturing. Um, but it is extremely rare that a player that allows for a scalable window like this to stretch the, uh, the data will ever display at the appropriate dimensions with the appropriate pixel values. I've done a lot of testing on that, and there's hardly any cases where that's, that's true. So this should be a big red flag for you if you see a player that does this. 
So if I need to get the video out of this, I don't have very many options. I can right click, don't see much. Uh, there's no buttons down here to do anything. Um, however, there is a file option that has an export API, great. Okay, so we click on that and it doesn't do anything. Um, so now we're stuck clicking around trying to find additional options. Um, I can toggle between the different camera views, which is nice. I can't really get much out other than maybe the images out of frame by frame, which again is a very time consuming process. That said, there is a, a bit of a benefit that the player has here um, because it is playing through all of the clips in one sequence. So if I go back to my camera one here, I can scrub through the data and I can see all of the different files playing back to back to back. Uh, it's a process that we refer to as concatenating. So instead of playing each individual file, it's put them all and allows us to scrub through it and play through all of them all at once. So let's take a quick look at what we see here within Input Ace. I'm going to take these different files, I'm going to drag them into my file list, I'm going to begin to look at these files, and I see now that they're 352 by 240, um, and I have a timeline, but the timeline only exists for one small clip. So if I go to my next clip, um, that's another small sequence, and each of these clips is what the player ends up playing through all in one sequence. Well, luckily the file names are going to be a bit of a help for us here because we can see that the naming convention here of uh, one, all for these files, followed by two for these files, refers to the camera angle. So these are all camera one, these here are all going to be camera twos, and then we have camera three down here. And what I want to ultimately do is create a result that I can play back in court easily that has all of my different clips playing back in one file again without changing any pixel values. Well, thankfully we have a very easy workflow for that. On my workflow tab, we have an advanced process called concatenate. Concatenate is going to allow me to connect any files to it and it's gonna put them together and on the output we'll have a clip that looks more similar to this result where it plays through all of the different sequences um, all back to back. But we have four different segments here. So if I was to create a concatenate output that was just this, um, all I'm going to have is one output. So maybe what I'd like to do is create multiple concatenate nodes, and I can actually duplicate my concatenate nodes by just clicking this plus button here. And now what I'm going to do is connect all of my camera twos into this concatenate node, and all my camera threes into the next concatenate node. And I've built now a more interesting workflow that takes each of the different cameras and is going to combine them and have them play back side by side. And now I need to define what kind of output format I'd like. So I'm gonna click on MP4, I'm going to give it an output name in my outputs directory called concatenate. Um, I'm going to leave the default settings here, and I'm just simply going to connect each of the concatenate nodes to my output to MP4, and my workflow is now done. Press execute, and what's happening here, again, is that each of the original files, each of camera ones are going into concatenate, camera twos is this one, and if I needed to change the order, I can simply open up the settings for concatenate, and I can see the order that it's going in, and I can drag and move this around. Um, another big benefit of input A's is that while things are processing, I still have full control of going through to my interrogate tab, um, playing through the file as I am now, uh, marking new images, making new clips, um, and now that it's done processing, I can go to my output directory here, and I can view the results, and sure enough, I have a clip now that plays through all of the events. So it's a very easy way um, to get any result that we might need from processing the video. So now that we've seen a couple of um, interesting workflows, let's put this all together into some case examples. So I'm going to um, delete out all of the stuff out of my workflow tab here. I'm going to remove um, my group, um, and I'm going to uh, walk through a few different case examples, looking at my time that I have left, um, I'm probably not going to have enough time to get through all of these, um, so I'm just going to touch on a couple. Um, the first one I'd like to touch on, I'm going to go through very quickly, again, for time's sake. Um, and this is actually uh, involving a case that our company just uh, testified in a couple weeks ago that you've probably seen on the news. It's a, it's a pretty high-profile one. Um, and one additional thing that I haven't had a chance to talk about yet is the concept of input ACE projects. Um, we've seen building various items in a file list and marking images and making subclips, um, and we have the ability through an input ace project to save all of that work and reload it at any future point in time. So to load an old project, what I'm going to do is click on my project actions drop down and press load, and I'm going to browse to um, 
that uh, folder here. I'm just going to do this as a quick shortcut to get there. And here's my frame timing project. I'm going to open that, and it's going to load all of the observations that I had um, from this event. So this is a um, police-involved uh, shooting case uh, where an officer uh, is involved in a uh, traffic stop. And um, the events that transpire here, I'm going to play through them quickly, um, ultimately lead to um, uh, shots fired. Um, and the individual here is, 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 uh, is shot and ends up dying on scene um, right about uh, here as he's uh, uh, in the process of pulling away. So the primary questions at hand here are the timing between the sound of the shot fired and the events of the vehicle beginning to move forward. Um, an expert on the other side had used this same original file, um, but had imported the file into Final Cut Pro, which had completely stripped out the relationship of timing between the video frames and the audio, uh, which was absolutely critical in this case. So what we needed to do was take a look at these frames and accurately identify the refresh rate frame by frame by frame through the file. You might notice that the video stream has a frame rate of 29.4857 frames per second, but what that data means is just an average of all of the refresh rates between all of the frames in the file. Um, these body-worn systems, uh, the vast majority of them, record at a variable refresh rate, which means that the amount of time that elapses between any one frame might be different than any subsequent frame. So let me take a look at how we can look at the action actual refresh rates frame by frame through the file. I do that by clicking on this Save Frame Analysis button. It's a single button push, which is now going through and building up a large amount of metadata that we have about this file, including the refresh rates frame by frame through the clip. In just a couple seconds here, this is going to open up in Excel, and I can now go a little bit deeper into reviewing the data directly at the time of the shot fired. Um, I should have mentioned also, please don't hesitate to ask any questions um, as the webinar is going. I'd be happy to, uh, to answer those as they come in. Um, and here's the results of my uh, XML file I've created. I'm just going to save this here as um, frame analysis. Um, this is going to open up here in Excel. Each of the column headers now um, give us detail about the frames, including what type of frame it is, what the size is, and the packet duration, which refers to uh, the difference in time between the different uh, PTS values. So what I'm going to use right now underneath this media type column is a process to filter out all the audio so that I'm just looking at the video. And now what I want to do is go down to the frame that occurs when the shot is fired. So here's the moment uh, directly after the shot fired. So the shot actually occurs between these two frames. And I'd like to snap to this frame within my spreadsheet. Well, the easiest way to do that is to look at my POS value, which refers to where in the file this frame exists, which is, for those of you who are uh, more comfortable with this, it's the binary byte position, so the byte location in the file where that frame actually exists. Um, and again, for advanced users, we can look within our frame metadata option here for hex at current position to view the exact location of where that frame is within hex. Um, but without going too deep into the weeds here, what I'm going to do is a very simple process right now to right-click this POS value and copy it. And then back in Excel, I'm going to find that value. So I've simply snapped down using Control-F to find that byte position. We can see the packet POS is right here. And I can now highlight that whole frame. And I can view uh, the exact frame and all the metadata related to the frame of video that this occurs on. And the important thing to note here is that the packet duration time is changing from frame to frame to frame to frame to frame. This frame right here is 0.032 seconds or 32 milliseconds in duration. But this one, for example, is 36 milliseconds. And we even have some additional ones here, like this one, which is 55 milliseconds. So the amount of time that elapses between any one frame might be dramatically different than some other frame. And if I look at the drop down here, we can see that the minimum frame is 25 milliseconds, and the maximum frame is all the way up at, at 131 milliseconds, which is an extreme difference. So if we don't understand this and we don't look frame by frame through the file, we can incorrectly identify motion, we can incorrectly identify time.
I'm in a case of, for example, importing the data into something like Final Cut Pro or another nonlinear editor, the nonlinear editor won't understand this variable refresh rate and will end up desyncing the audio from the video. In this particular case, that made the sound of the shot occur at a very different moment than when the shot was actually fired, which was crucial to the evidence in this case. Uh, so again, because I'm kind of running over on time, I'm going to jump ahead to another case example. Um, and forgive me, I was hoping to go a little in more detail about that particular case, but I'm going to have to jump ahead. So let's take a quick look. Um, this is probably where I'm going to have to end. I had another case example that I'm likely going to need to skip over for time's sake. Um, but I'd like to walk through uh, an entire case, kind of from beginning to end, as rapidly as we can. Um, this particular case involves a uh, slip and fall um, at a grocery store. And if I drag these .ssf files into Input Ace, again with a proprietary player that um, makes a lot of uh, horrendous, uh, incorrect decisions about how to play the file back. Um, but if I go into Input Ace, I can view the original files at their original size. And on this particular camera view, if I scrub forward in time, we'll notice that at this point right here, uh, an individual, if I zoom in, ends up slipping and falling to the ground. Uh, and this is a liability case um, for the store. And right at that moment, we see him slip. The same individual ends up taking a photograph of an area on the ground uh, that was submitted to us that looks like this. Um, where he's asserting that he slipped on this puddle of water, and the primary questions at hand are, when did the water appear, if this is indeed water? Um, can we see this within the video? And can we identify how long between the moment that this came on the ground and the moment that the individual slipped? So to do that, I'm going to go through this very quickly in the same method that uh, we use in this case to scrub to an area where I can see that area in detail. We'll notice that I can see some distinctive markings on the ground here that if I go back to my uh, image here, I can see those same uh, basic areas here on the ground that I'm seeing now within my image. So is that indeed the water and can I see when that appeared? Well, let's scrub even further back in time towards the beginning of the file and that's no longer there. Let me go back to where we see the, um, the item on the ground and then back to the beginning, it's gone. So let's try to identify when exactly that appears. And we'll notice that at this moment, it is not there. An individual stands directly in that position. And then as soon as he moves his foot, we see that item on the ground. So that already is very helpful. But let me do a couple of quick things to identify timing. So I'm going to use this moment when he moves his foot. I'm going to mark my uh, marker with an M key. I'll say uh, male moves foot. I'm going to then scrub forward to the moment in time when the individual slips right here where he steps directly on that area. I'll hit my M key and I'll say slip. So I now have these two markers. I can see the markers in the timeline. I can even mark my out and toggle to my other marker using my plus and minus keys and mark my in. And I can look at the timestamp that we're pulling out of the file, and I can calculate the actual time, which is somewhere around two and a half minutes. So that answer is already done. Let's do one additional thing to make this even more clear. So what I'm going to do is right before the fall, um, when we actually see that date on the ground, I'm going to mark an out, and I'm going to scroll back in time. Oops, let me actually mark the out uh, closer to here. So I'm going to mark my out here, and I'm going to scroll back further in time. I'm trying to get a clip of data that spans a large area of time before the slip and fall occurs. So I'm going to keep going forward here to play route right there. And I'm going to mark my out key. So I've got a little clip of a bunch of frames. I'm going to now make a sub clip and call this out. And I'm going to go towards my beginning before the individual arrives. And I'm going to make another sub clip before that little area is on the ground. So somewhere in about right here, I'm going to mark an in scrub forward to an area where uh, we have no one walking in the view, make a subclip and mark it an out. Excuse me, that should be called in. So I'm going to make my little, um, uh, change the name of this by clicking on my settings, and I'm going to change the name of that to uh, before. So now I got my before and my out. The reason I'm doing this is I'm trying to get as many frames as I can so I can clarify these and create a clean image to compare. So on my workflow tab, I'm going to resize my out 
I'm going to double the size of this to times two. And then lastly, I'm going to put that advanced process into frame average. I'm going to open the settings for frame average, and I'm going to name this on my desktop here. I'm going to call this my, um, but like before the slip and fall, so after the data is on the ground or after that area is on the ground. So I'll call this before fall. And what frame average is doing is taking all the images connected to it, and it's averaging the pixel values to clarify that data, make it a little bit cleaner. Now I'm going to take my before, connect it to the same thing, just simply change the name of my, um, my frame average, and I'll call this, um, instead of before fall, I'll call this before water, and I'll execute that, and now I'm already done. So let's take a quick look at those two images. I've got my before fall, and I've got my uh, before water, and we can look at this, and we can see that data just pop right in. So again, a clarified image of before the water is present, and then all of a sudden, the water's there. And we can see that data distinctly pop in, and we can compare that to the shape of the data that's on the ground. Now again, obviously, if I was spending a little more time on this and not rushing through the end of a webinar, I would probably create subclips that had a larger area of time to make it even cleaner. But I wanted to show you how we can put these assets together. We can clarify them very quickly, and we can uh, easily begin to build observations about a case. Um, the very last thing that I'm going to show um, is how we put all this together into a full report. Um, I'm going to have to skip over um, using a full case report using a robbery on uh, this particular video, um, but I'd like to walk through within about a minute of um, uh, the kinds of things that can be built within an input ace project. So this particular executable file shows a, um, a robber that ends up um, entering this store um, he comes up to the register, um, steals some money, and then runs out of the store. So here he is uh, about to enter. Oh, excuse me, let me go back in time a little bit. Well, again, I'm having trouble using the proprietary player because it doesn't like to scrub forward and backward very well. So instead, let's go and use this with an input ace, and get a little bit of additional clarity through this by interrogating and viewing the exe directly from its streams, directly with an input ace. Uh, I now have the ability of scrubbing forward and backward in the timeline in a way that is much easier, much more dynamic, and gives me a much more flexible range of, of images. So at this point in time here, uh, the individual comes into the store, he's wearing a mask and some distinctive clothing, and we can go through and mark series of images to put all of that together into a report. So what I'll show you is a simple image and a simple clip. Um, instead of doing the entire case report just for time's sake, I'm going to mark an in before the individual enters the store. I'm going to play through this event where he comes to the register, he ends up taking the money out of the register, he then exits the store momentarily here, and now he's out of the store, and I'm going to mark my out, make a clip, and I'm going to call this events, and I'll mark one quick image of him at the register. How about here? So suspect at register. On a real case, when I'm doing this uh, for the purpose of putting this together into a report, um, I'm going to take all of the observations, many more than I've just made, and I'm going to combine them into a narrative PDF report using Input Ace. It's a very powerful tool. It uh, allows us to uh, immediately release bolos. It allows us to combine all of our evidence into a very easy-to-read report, and that's all built on our tools page under Narrative Report. So Narrative Report starts with a title page. I'm just going to type in a quick case number here, case number 1234. Um, we'll call this report title... Um, for immediate release. Um, and then you can fill in additional information like our agency and the author name. I'll just type in my name for now. And then now we can click on any items that we like, like for example, the suspect at the register and the clip of the events, and I can add those to my report. So by pressing that Add to Report button, we now see that we have an image and we have our subclip. We can begin to add observations about this image and say um, image of suspect at register. And I can also write observations about my subclip and say uh, a clip of all events from main camera. Again, I would be adding typically a lot more observations, a lot more images on this. But when I press the generate report button, this final report is going to take all of these different clips and embed them directly into a single PDF. Here's the PDF. It's organized with my title page and it's includes my images and my subclip. 
so that when I click on my image, it automatically opens the raw, uncompressed. If I click on the video, it opens up back the entire clip. Again, playing too quickly, but we could change that easily within Input Ace. So you can see how we can very quickly monitor a report. Really articulating observations about the events, and it automatically embeds all the items within the PDF. Now that entire PDF is a single PDF file that could be emailed to an individual, uploaded to Dropbox. Um, it's actually rather large, uh, 21 meg, uh, very small, all things considered, but large enough to probably upload to Dropbox. Um, and that entire PDF file can be uh, sent around, and anyone who opens that will see this in the exact same way. Can click on the evidence and open it up. Um, a finalized report generally looks something more like this, where we have a more thorough report. Um, this one was built by a student in the two-day class that we offer. Um, everyone goes through the process of um, going through each of the technical um, nodes within the workflow, beginning to think through the input ace workflow in a logical, sound manner, and then combining um, observations in a real case into a very thorough report, talking about an individual, um, his shoes, um, his clothing, all the observations leading through the report and culminating in a clip where we've used the concatenate node to concatenate all the different camera angles together. So instead of simply viewing, like we did earlier, a concatenation of the same camera, this allows us to produce a demonstrative tracking the suspect in a very easy way within a matter of minutes with an input ace. So I know that I went through the end here very quickly. Um, I, I ended up going a little over on, on timing, so I apologize for speeding things up towards the end. Um, I hope that um, this was helpful to those of you who are using Input Ace, um, and hopefully um, helpful for those of you who are interested in Input Ace, getting an idea of the various things that can be done within the program. There's obviously a lot more that we can do, um, but please feel free to look at the other uh, webinars that we have up online um, to get a more thorough understanding. Um, and if you'd like a 30-day trial, uh, we do offer a 30-day uh, trial to anyone who'd like one. Um, and if you are willing, at the very end of this webinar here in a few minutes, um, if you take the uh, survey that pops up, you'll be entered into a drawing for a six-month uh, trial version. Um, so please do take advantage of that. Even if you already have a license, it can go on a new machine. So with that, I'm going to open this up to questions. Um, please feel free to um, uh, ask any questions now. Um, I, I do see a couple that come in during the webinar that I didn't get a chance to get to. Um, so um, I see a question about um, the workflows and how uh, we can report uh, what kinds of workflows have been done. Uh, well, within Input Ace, on the Workflow tab, any workflow, no matter how um, complicated the workflow is, can be saved using the Workflow Actions dropdown. To save that workflow, we can give it a quick name, like this one, for example, is just Resize. And any future point in time, um, we can open up Input Ace and see this workflow, export it with the case. It can be reused. It can be emailed. Um, it can be imported into another version of Input Ace. So if you export the workflow, um, anyone else who has Input Ace can import that workflow, and it will rebuild all of the nodes directly as you see them within the workflow tab. Um, I see a quick question about um, whether or not this webinar is being recorded. Um, yes, it is, and we'll be posting this online as well. Um, so I'll make sure that um, uh, we get that out to everyone who's uh, viewing right now. Um, I see a question about um, uh, listening to audio to sync multiple videos together. Um, yes, uh, we do play back audio on the interrogate tab. Uh, in fact, um, my speakers are simply muted right now, um, but each of the clips that had audio, uh, you would be hearing on, on your station if you're playing that um, directly through your speakers. Um, so we do have the ability of syncing audio and video together as well. Um, and then, uh, let me see here. Um, sorry, I'm going through a list of questions, and they're rather small. Um, I see another question about um, whether or not the reports that we are producing can be saved um, within a project. And the answer is yes. Uh, an input ace project consists of everything that is in the file list. And it exists, and it includes everything that is currently built within the tools page under the narrative report items. So if you're spending time building up a narrative report, when you save the project and you reload the project at a later point in time, it will rebuild all those assets. Um, I also see a question about the Canvas editor, if it has an option to place a smaller video on top of another one. Um, the answer is yes. 
the Canvas editor can combine together assets of any size. So for example, if I have a um, video file here where I've got uh, the original file in the Canvas and maybe a, uh, let's do a quick uh, crop and resized version. I can crop and resize that same angle. Let me just crop like the ATM for example here. Um, I can then resize that to any size that I want. Let's go times three for this quick example. And then if I put that into the Canvas editor, when I open the settings up, I'll have both, and I can simply move those around wherever I'd like to put them. So it can take in multiple different sized clips. Um, in fact, we can even auto-tile um, clips of any size. So you could have 16 clips that are all different sizes, and it would auto-tile all of them into the one canvas. So I know we're going a little over. I see a lot of questions in here. I'm going to get a chance to answer just a couple more, uh, and then I'll probably turn this over to Doug to, um, to wrap us up. Um, and I see a question about um, how many files that we can concatenate at once. Um, is there a limit? And the answer to that is um, actually a little, little complicated. Um, there isn't technically a limit to the number of files that can be concatenated together, but there is a limitation um, within Windows about the number of characters that can be used. So if you have a very long file name and you have a thousand clips, there's a chance that you will encounter an error, um, but one of the ways to work around that would be to rename the files so they're a little bit shorter. Um, that will get around that small limitation. Um, but if you encounter errors ever within the program um, where something that you're trying to process um, gives you a message and you'd like some clarification on that message, the best thing to do is to go into the help menu to click on submit feedback to type in the events that occurred and generate the report. What this will do is create a dot feedback file that you will be able to send to us, and then we can look at it and tell you exactly what was going on within the program. Um, again, feedback reports don't give us any of your evidence or anything critical on your computer. It's just simply the interop uh, interoperations that were happening within input ace when an error was generated. Um, all right, so the last question I'm going to get a chance to answer uh, is about the training classes that I mentioned. Um, I see someone was um, wondering if there's classes in their area. Um, on our website um, at uh, www.inputace.com dot inputace.com um, the website has an events page um, my internet's uh, slowing down here a little bit because of being on uh, go to webinar here um, for this webinar but on our events page uh, we have a full calendar that articulates all the various training events that we offer and on the far right hand side um, are each of the input ACE training classes that are upcoming. So we've got two coming up next month. Um, we've got a bit of a break uh, in August, um, and then in September we're uh, going to be in North Carolina. Uh, and we've got several other ones on the books that are coming up. Uh, we've had roughly, as you can see, uh, about a class every single month uh, this whole year, and we plan on keeping up with that uh, throughout the year. Um, we've gotten great feedback on uh, on what we go through in those classes. Um, it's for me, uh, as an instructor when teaching the class, um, I personally really enjoy it. Uh, we're not just simply going through the uh, workflows with an input ace. Um, as you can see in the last hour, the workflows are extremely easy to build. It's all drag and drop. Um, so for the full two-day class, we're able to go into some great detail about the stuff happening under the hood. Um, it's technical, but I make it easy. Um, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you guys in the class in the future. Um, so with that, I'm a little over on time. I'm going to turn it back over to Doug. Um, Doug, if you're if you're still on, if you want to take it from there, and thank you everyone I, I for am. attending. I am still here. <laughs> so um, Andrew, thank you very much. As as always, I'm always fascinated when to to watch it and continue to see the uh, product evolve. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, I've been doing the the video forensic side of it on the uh, sales side, honestly, for almost 20 years, and I never seen a product that works the way this works and does so much of the daily pain that people have had that I've heard about for so long, takes so much of it away so quickly and so effectively. So it's a very exciting product. And Andrew, you did a terrific job. Thank you. And I think with that, we're going to uh, uh, end the session. Again, if you, if you want a trial, reach out to us. Uh, if you want a proposal, uh, reach out to us as well. We'd be glad to get that to you. Thanks so much, and thanks for attending.